Hey everyone, it's This Week in Science. We are here for another episode of Twists. I don't know if Blair is going to make it tonight. She is, um, she was at a climate change education conference today, so she's busy helping to change the world, which is really awesome. We could support that for an evening. Justin, are you ready to get started? Ready to go. Shall we? Shall we shall. Rock and roll. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. What we humans do today will change the history of tomorrow. And the best changes will come from science. Science is pushing the envelope, thinking outside the box, casting the wide net to catch the common thread, finding patterns in chaos, solving unsolved problems, thinking the impossible, designing, building, and bringing the impossible into reality. Thanks to science, we can think, dream, build, observe, cure, create, and cultivate a world of possibilities never before within the reach of humanity. So much has been and is being discovered that the average person, even the above average science aficionado, can have trouble keeping up with all the developing data. As with any problem we humans encounter, we have created a solution. Your lack of information has a cure in This Week in Science. Coming up next. I don't know why it's not on. <laughs> oh, wait, I found it. Hold on. <laughs> That's just going to be a very little edit for it. Hold on. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening. Kirsten, and potentially later on, Blair. <laughs> good science to you, too, Justin. It's good to be back. We took a week off to go trick-or-treating with the little ones, and I had a really, really great time. Yes, Halloween is an also, always an awesome evening as a parent. We're getting to pilfer candy from your children. Yeah, the kids don't necessarily understand why they get to go around and ask people for candy at this point in time, but... It's all in fun. It was mm -hmm. a good time enjoyed by all. And now is another kind of good time enjoyed by all. The science time. Science! That's right. Uh, tonight, lots of stories on the docket. I have stories about space, lots of Kepler mission stuff, uh, some monkey brains, and mm, crow poo. Harbinger of Doom. Mm -hmm. I have, as uh, as sometimes as is usual, uh, way too many stories to fit into a single hour. So we'll get to as many of them as we can for the regular show, and then the rest of the content will be thrown up on the interwebs after. I've got chocolate that makes you skinnier. <laughs> yeah? Lon mm -hmm. Sprinkler Asteroids. Uh, reversal of Aging. Regeneration in our day and age. Cows killing cancer, a, something, a, a form of uh, energy gathering that's even more efficient than solar panels and creates no waste. RNA, DNA transcription story, a P story even <laughs> involved in the mix here. So there's quite a bit, and that, that's, just, that's just what I think we can get to in the first hour, hopefully. Yeah. Let's try and keep it to an hour. Let's see what we can do. Let's make it or break it, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so the first first bit of news that I wanted to jump into was, of course, the news that we tend to follow on a regular basis. So, science and politics, what's going on in the world of the United States and the political sphere? Well, I think I spoke briefly at one point recently about the Frontiers in Innovation, Research, Science, and Technology Act of 2013. I think I brought that up a few episodes ago. Um, this is a an act that would place a burden, well, 
not that there aren't already, but this is what the NSF does. The National Science Foundation um, gives grants as one of its uh, as one of its dictates, its mandates. It gives grants to researchers um, who give them reason to give them money. Researchers fill out very long application forms and describe the research that they want to do, and then the NSF goes through all of them and gives a very, very, very small number of the researchers who apply money to do their work. Um, in each of these grant application packets that people put together is what's called a section on broader impacts. Now those broader impacts have to do with how the research is going to do more than just be basic science. What are the broader impacts of the research that you're doing, right? How's it going to affect humanity, our role in the universe, I don't know, mice with no left toe. I'm just making st stuff up now. <laughs> um, however, uh, um, there have been draft bills in uh, in preparation uh, by the Republican Republican led House Committee on Science Space and Technology and uh, this new this version that is going to be reviewed on November 13th so coming up here within the next week um, it's going to add another burden to the NSF that every time they give somebody money they have to publish on their website um, what uh, what the research is, how it's justified, how the grant funding is justified. So the NSF okay. then is going to have to take time and money to explain how it how some researchers funding fits the following six goals: economic competitiveness health and welfare, scientific literacy, partnerships between academia and industry, and promotion of scientific progress and national defense. So it has to be economic, industrial, or military um, tied in. Yes. Or three of those, at least. Pretty, pretty, pretty much. Um, the... The conversation that's happening at this point in time about this first act um, basically has people on one side saying, well, if we are short on money, we have to justify every dollar that goes out, and every dollar has to go for science now has to go towards making something happen. Well, Researchers so and I, sci I... scientists on the other side go, hey, that's not really how science works, and there's a whole lot of cool stuff that we have now that we wouldn't have had if this had been in this process had been in place for the last fifty years. So the whole idea of this translational research, research that has to have a purpose and a function, um, it's not necessarily helping. I mean, it will help, but there's a lot of about science that you just need that creativeness to try something yeah and it also this is also again oversight in government sometimes comes at a, at a really big cost which is the political agenda of the political oversight um, there's a very discouraging element that that's growing in, in, in this that I do not like the sound of whatsoever yeah. yeah. Although, although you know, if this was to become general practice, you know, we could ask how a lot of dollars are justified that are spent <laughs> by the government. Right. Uh, Does it are, only have to be for science? Can we justify everything? <laughs> yeah. I mean, this it just you know, again, what I, I think the number for the bank bailout was something to the tune of fourteen years of the full budget of the National Science Foundation, maybe even more than that. It was yeah. just such a ridiculous sum of money. Yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. You know, and for, for stuff like that to be able to go out and we spend we spend next to nothing on on the from the National Science Foundation uh, to support science in this country for the amount of science that we could be doing. Yeah. Um, partly that works out good for those researchers who do make the cut. Uh, they get paid pretty handsomely because you know there's not that many 
uh, scientists out there that can, you know, that are that are getting into these roles, so they can demand a pretty good salary for it. But it's not really the point. It's not really the. It's not a market analysis from the scientist's perspective. They would like to be doing the work. Yeah, yeah. Most scientists would like to be doing the work, and I would have to say that I think the majority of scientists out there are really not making. Um, a lot of money on the work that they do. <laughs> um, okay, moving on. India. Good India job. launched a vehicle that's going to go orbit around Mars. Nice. Yeah, they've got it. Um, their their uh, launch craft that to actually get it out of orbit and to get it on its way um, wasn't. They they found that it wasn't going to be capable of. Uh, of getting their their shift their ship that they call mom m o m I'm sure it's not called mom um, <laughs> but it's known as m o m also by the informal name of Mangalayan or Mars craft um, they're doing a really interesting technique looping it around the earth several times over the next month or so or two months to actually get it uh, to build up enough velocity using the gravity of Earth to be able to shoot it out and off to Mars. So we won't actually see whether it'll reach Mars for, uh, a, little, for a little while, but we're very excited about India trying to get out. Yes, um, although if my uh, original series Star Trek um, view of how physics works still holds true today, that would actually put them back into the 1940s. <laughs> it would cause them to go backwards in time. No, but I think they, need, they have to go really, really fast around the Earth. Yeah. I don't think they're slingshotting that fast. They're just, they're maybe just they doing normal the, slingshots. Maybe Star Trek they use the sun. So maybe they'll only go back to like 1985 or something. They're not Superman. They're not Star Trek. This is just... India with a craft that's mm -hmm. going to go look for methane plumes on Mars. Awesome. That is yeah. totally right. I'm glad that uh, India is using its resources in this way. Yeah, I Fantastic. am Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and then what was the last thing that I wanted to get out here in the very beginning of the show? Oh, yeah, Russian asteroids. Uh, um, two new studies about the, Tel the Chelyabinsk meteor suggest a couple of things about it that number one it was a single space rock a lot of um, ideas about asteroids are that many of them occur as accumulations of lots of little rocks and dust and stuff that have just glommed together this particular asteroid was probably a single space rock that had stretch stress fractures from probably running into something else at some point in time. Um, and so that was part of how it broke up upon impact. And thanks to modern technology and the, the video that they have of this meteor coming into its impact um, with the atmosphere of our planet, um, they were able to tell a lot about where it came from, how big it was. There's all sorts of information that um, astronomers and physicists have used to find out uh, inf info about the Chelyabinsk uh, meteor. Another thing that they did find out um, doing calculations and kind of thinking about asteroids and approaching the Earth and uh, meteoroid impact, meteor impacts, uh, they say that uh, these kinds of impacts, as in impacts as big as this Chelyabinsk impact, happen probably on the range of about once every 25 years. So a lot more commonly than people had thought. Hmm. Yeah, there's a great write-up of all of this by Phil Plate over on the, his Slate blog. So if you want to read up a little bit more, I suggest yeah. that. Although, once every 25 years across the history of the planet, uh, you know, there could be sometimes where it's a thousand years between and still yeah. beat the average. And then there's, the you know, once every, like, once every 25 years in the history of the planet, and then, okay, what areas of the planet are on the, the ecliptic, which is the... Um, the plane on at which most of the asteroids approach, and uh, where are larger land masses that would actually that people would actually see this stuff happening? So, 
Russia is kind of a big target. I think we've discussed this before. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of land mass out there in Asia and Eastern Europe. A lot of land mass. All right, tell me a story, Justin. Okay, so I almost don't know where to start because there's so many good stories. Uh, Let's start at the very beginning. Uh, let me see here. Yeah. Oh, here's a good one. Actually, this is one that I, I, did, I didn't even tease out in the beginning, but it's one of my favorite ones. Uh, one worm, two mouths. Depending uh, on the... <laughs> uh, uh -huh. uh, depending on the environment in which the worm grows... The larva of the roundworm, Pritica something cucca specificus, develops into either a wide-mouthed predator or a narrow-mouthed bacteria eater. So somewhere in the same worm, but some point in its development, it takes two different biological directions. This is that's I don't know of another species that does this. I don't think I've ever heard of anything like this. A team of researchers, the Max Planck Institute of Evolutionary Biology in Germany, headed by Ralph J. Sommer, have now discovered the developmental biological switch that determines the worm's mouth form. According to this, the scientists are now able to explain how organisms adapt to different surrounding conditions. When it comes to survival, uh, survival flexibility is a trump card. The principle also applies to the microscopic round worm which, is, which uh, is being researched by these scientists. Uh, depending on the environment in which it grows, it develops either sh a short, wide mouth or a long, narrow one. The wide mouth variant, which has a single tooth, is suitable for carrying out predatory attacks. The narrow version, in contrast, is mainly used for grazing on bacterial food sources. The developmental path taken by this by the larva is not decided by its genus, but by the environment in which it is it finds itself. When the animals were starved, or when too many worms crowded the petri dish, researchers observed the increased development of the wide mouth variant, which is interesting because that uh, assumes then they're going to be predatory against other roundworms, doesn't it? Like there's too many of us, we need to add a predator to our our biosystem. Let's just self-regulate here. Yeah, you know what? That's pretty amazing. Well, I, huh. yeah, I wonder where that would specifically come from, though. Like, so they found a gene which functions basically like a switch and selects yeah. the suitable variant from the two possible uh, forms. The discovery of the gene was... Uh, the success of this experiment, to which uh, roundworms were particularly suited due to their short generation time. I'm, it's sort of to me hinting that there's other, there's other uh, bi biological forms out there that can do this, that can sort of pick up a different path. But I don't know what those possibly could have been. I've never heard of anything like this. And they discovered mutated worm lines only produce worms with uh, the narrow mouths. So the, if this gene mutates, it goes narrow mouth, irrespective of the environmental conditions and in which the same gene is in inactivated, we were, we were able to show that a, that a gene that we found in a genetic experiment under laboratory conditions controls an ecologically significant characteristic. What's interesting though is what then informs that gene if it's doing so under certain conditions. So armed with the information that they located the, the mutant gene or the gene that would, you know, the switching gene. They cross-checked their findings and introduced additional copies of the gene to the worms using genetic engineering correct, uh, and basically adding that gene into, uh, into the other worms. Almost all of these transgenic worms develop the wide mouth form with the characteristic tooth. So is, they say the gene works like a train dispatcher at a large railway station who decides which platform a high-speed train can pull into based on the current traffic situation. During critical phase in the worm's development, it follows the one-way track to a wide mouth or a narrow mouth. Hmm. The capacity of many organisms to tailor their development to the changing demands of the environment is known as phenotypic plasticity. Discovery of see, I've never. But what else does this? I've never heard. It must, uh, you know. 
must all happen in really small stuff. Right. Well, it's the diff. the The question is, you know, what what controls the trait and being able to actually see it in the laboratory and finding this in in the worm is an interesting new development for that because it um, can potentially tell us something about uh, the control of, you know, the uh, the digestive tract, the mouth for, you know, other organisms that have evolved. But we also have um, genetic control or even phenotypic control over the shape of a beak, say the Galapagos finches, where in some individuals it is just simply certain certain genes being turned on or turned off as a result of um, environmental stress, mm. food in the environment, water in the envir environment, that kind of thing. Um, and so one generation having particular traits and then a couple of generations down the line, those traits slowly morphing into a slightly different beak shape. So, so here's a question. Here's a question. Is this phenotypic plasticity? And, and it may, is this a, could you call this a proof of some form of Lamarckian hmm? evolution? No, because this is just uh, specifically one gene. No. Right, right. It's one gene. It's a mutation, but the mutation is environmentally instructed. Triggered. Right, mm -hmm. which is sort of Lamarck's theory. And, you know, uh, that the environment is what causes speciation. Yeah, you the, keep pushing this Lamarck thing. Well, no, no, I just... And I, Lamarck I, was not I, exactly right. No, he wasn't exactly he had, right in the same way that yeah. uh, Darwin wasn't exactly right. There's been a lot of science since both of those gentlemen <laughs> were on the planet. But I do like it because I always liked the Lamarckian idea, even though it's not the, the larger catalyst. The idea that you could have this phenotypic plasticity, we have now epigenetics and all. Mm -hmm. have the environment... Plays a huge role. As, huge. As much as we... It's not just... You know, and in a way, it takes away a certain amount of the need to have random mutation being a big player. And you can say, hey, you know, there may be environmentally driven mutations that are informing uh, speciation as well as natural yeah. science. Yeah, so the thing about epigenetics is that it's not actually changing the genes themselves you know it's changing uh, how the genes are expressed so whether they're turned off whether they are upregulated um, you know there it's so there are, could potentially be more instructions to upregulate a particular gene which would lead to the change in a particular trait because there's more proteins being expressed or something like that. Um, but as for that upper level actually leading to mutation, I mean, it's possible. I mean, hide, they hide, epigenetics hides mutations. So if you have mutations in the genome and those are hidden because they're all wrapped up and not being expressed because of epigenetics, and then suddenly an environmental trigger goes bam and takes the wrapping off. All of a sudden that DNA expands, gets expressed, and a whole bunch of mutations that were not were there the whole time but just were not expressed. And that's when you get some kind of dramatic change, I think. Mm -hmm. But that those mutations could have been passed on anyway if they were in the germ cell. If they're in the body cells, if they're in the cells of an individual's just body and not reproductive cells, it's not going to be passed on. The mutations have to be in the reproductive cells. And the, and the epigenetic instructions have to be in the reproductive cells too. It's a very complex system. Nobody really understands it yet. We can... We can Hypothelologize all we want, but <laughs> but this is kind of interesting now. This does this does uh, this is something. I, it's one of those. Every once in a while, we come across something on the show that I didn't know that existed. I didn't know mm -hmm. that was 
in nature or in the uh, in physics or in the universe or in anywhere in reality. But I I hadn't I can't think of a species that I've ever heard of that so dramatically changes its uh, whether it's a grazer or a predator. Uh, you know, has different. One has a tooth and one's got a little snout mouth. Yeah, right? completely different, completely different. And it's the yeah. same species. It's the environment informing it which one uh, which one will be produced. Hmm. Too many competitors. It's hmm. time to start eating each other. Yeah. <laughs> you just tuned in. This is This Week in Science, and Blair is not here. So in honor of Blair's... Animal Corner, um, I have a couple of animal stories. Kirsten yep. doing Blair's Animal Corner with Kirsten. Yay! She likes <laughs> birds. I do. And, I, and I do, which is kind of strange because they don't like each other. They don't uh, like each other. Well, cats like to eat the birds. But anyway, um, really interesting study that uh, has been um, that has such long ranging implications. Uh, researchers have been collecting bird poo. They have um, researchers at Virginia Tech studying antibiotic resistance. Uh, oh, wait, uh, maybe it's not Virginia Tech, but these researchers, here we go, uh, studying antibiotic resistance. In animals, here we go. Uh, let me see where did this study get published. Totally blowing all these details. Bloop, 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 bloop. Tuft University Veterinary School researchers collecting bird poo. They collected collected a bunch of crow poo. They went um, and collected 600, nearly 600 samples of bird poo in Massachusetts, Kansas, New York, and California. Fifteen out of those crow samples, or about 2.5 percent, harbored genes for vancomycin resistance. Vancomycin is the, what is quote-unquote called the drug of last resort for for hospital acquired infections. Hmm. And so crows with genes for bacteria antibiotic resistance were found in Massachusetts, Kansas, New York. None in California though, which I find very interesting. Um, they did this review of, um, of bird poo to find out uh, where, where are genes for antibacterial resistance showing up in nature? Are they showing up outside of um, livestock? Are they showing up outside of human systems? Where are they showing up? We know that antibiotics are getting into the water supply. We know that they are getting into a lot of different areas in our environment. So what are the effects that are that are occurring downstream? Uh, they just thinking about where the crows might have picked up the, the genes for resistance, the back, and really when you're talking about the genes for resistance, what you're talking about is they picked up bacteria that were resistant somewhere. And so the crows could have picked up the bacteria in dumpsters diving for food. Uh, they could have picked them up um, near livestock if they were going for food, stepping in uh, livestock feces at, at big industrial, agricultural industrial sites. Um, the vancomycin resistance in the wild crows does bear the signature of a human clinical source as opposed to a livestock source, which is interesting. Um, there are mutations that can be followed to actually trace where the resistance came from, and so they are trying to find out where, where these things originated. And so to know that there is drug resistance coming from hospitals and healthcare sitting settings and ending up in the wild just it just makes I don't know it gives me a little pause give me a little pause yep. these are flying animals who fly from place to place and can take things a lot further further than um, 
than other organisms. So, very not good. But um, California is still safe, right? Like, we're okay. <laughs> but California is still fine. California Whatever, we're, we're, we're still doing all right in California. Mm-hmm. All right, so the other animal-y story that I brought has to do with monkey brains. And we Speaking have... Speaking of monkey brains, Blairla! Hi! Hi, I you're here. It. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. Yay, welcome to the show. Thank you. I was you. just going to talk about monkey brains. We're doing your oh, animal I corner. Oh, I wish you would. Please <laughs> do my animal corner. <laughs> All right, so monkey brains, we have spoken before on the show about brain-computer interfaces in which, um, in which some needles, are, electrodes are stuck into the brain of the uh, motor cortex uh, or premotor cortex of rhesus monkeys, and then the monkeys are trained to move either a cursor on a screen or a robotic arm that's in another room With or their mind around the alone. world yeah and and as far i think as far as we've gotten is that there have been monkeys controlling robotic arms half halfway around the world away from them so monkeys in the US controlling japanese robot arms which is pretty pretty cool which which However, is all yeah go ahead Oh, which is also, and then there, there was an experiment where they, they did this with the skull caps of the students trying to get another student to move a finger. What, what's, what's really interesting here, too, though, it, it's one thing if you think about the direct connection, it's a monkey using its thoughts to move a mechanical object. But what's really going on is the monkey's cortex is communicating to a computer. Yeah. And the computer is electronically sending out these signals that's causing the motion of the electronic arm. And that student who was affected by the other person's uh, motor cortex moving his finger also was being sent, of course, through a computer, through, through the Internet in that case. Yeah. So what that actually means is you could develop, in theory, a program that could affect the motor cortex of an individual or being a robot and have it be completely separate from another person thinking it at the other end. So you could create a program where you could input, I want this individual to move their leg or twitch their finger, and if they were wearing the skull cap or were wired in, they would do so. So you could, yeah. you could reverse it too. You could make the machine control the, the organic brain. You could. So in in these brain computer interface designs, the uh, eventual goal is to be able to allow somebody to move two arms in collaboration. Um, because just moving one arm around, how often do you only move one arm around? Not so often. So. Um, a researcher named Nicolelis in uh, Duke University, Miguel Nicolelis at Duke University, is eventually, he's trying to develop some, basically like a, an exoskeleton or a Gundam, if you're into Japanese anim anime, an exoskeleton for people who are paralyzed. And for the exoskeleton to work, it would have to be able to get both arms and both legs to move in conjunction and collaborate, communicate, everything would have to work together. So in this experiment what they did is they stuck, instead of just putting electrodes in one side of the brain to control something on the other side, uh, they put electrodes, electrodes in both sides of the brain. So they had electrodes in the right and the left hemisphere and the monkeys moved two robotic arms. But it wasn't as successful as previous experiments have been showing that there is still some amount of, um, of training or, or algorithm development that needs to occur to actually get things to work more smoothly. But it is a proof of concept that getting the two arms to work together, it can happen. And it probably will happen eventually, very well. And I wonder, I wonder if these, uh, if in this experiment they had spent as much time training the monkeys, because now the other experiment 
Um, it took a long time, and at first the, the monkeys they, they started... Trained the, they trained the monkeys for weeks. It was only two monkeys, a male yeah, and a female. Yeah, so that's not a very long time. The other ones were training a long time. They were using... They first trained them to play a video game where they mm -hmm. used a joystick interface. Yeah, that's they what they, they did this. They did the same interface. The same interface, the, yeah, and eventually the monkeys two. didn't have to touch the joystick because they were also wired in with the cortex, and then because that the... Then that's how they they could then control the computer through the cortex because it was firing off the same signals as when they were using the joystick. So the joystick kind of trained the computer as to how to respond to the cortex. Once it was trained and the monkey was trained, the monkey didn't actually need to touch anything. It could just move stuff. Exactly. That's what it, that's what happened in this situation. However, this time it was moving two arms and. Um, what seems to come up here is that you'd think that you have motor cort cortices on both sides of your brain, right? Mm -hmm. On the right side, you're controlling the left. On the left side, you're controlling the right. And the neurons, if you're just controlling one arm, they act a particular way. And if you're controlling both arms and trying to coordinate movements, like if I grab the microphone with both my hands or decide I need to do some kind of alternating punching movement. The neurons don't act the same way anymore. They actually have a different pattern of movement hmm. when, they're, when they are collaborating than they, when they're acting individually. So there's a, little, there's a higher level of complexity there with the addition of the second arm. And on top of this, I, Ulysses on Twitter sent me a question. There's some some new Twitter account that has all these facts that are thrown out and sometimes they're totally wrong and sometimes they are are right, but they say they're facts. You know, this is the name of their Twitter account, Something Facts, and I'm not going to advertise them on here because uh, I'm not getting any money. But the uh, the fact that they that they put out is that left-handed people are more prone to anger and depression. And I was looking into that. Ulysses wanted to know if that was true. So I uh, did a little background research and found that um, the uh, that what happens is uh, the the uh, arm that you're moving, the hand that you're moving, of course, is you, that you use more dominantly to do something, your intended movement, or to take away. So um, that dominant hand is more often controlled in the hemisphere of, uh, on the right hemisphere for left-handed individuals, and that is also in line with um, nuclei that are related to the fear, anger, depression kind of stuff. And so it's not that it has been definitively shown. We're just basically looking at surveys to this point and um, some questionnaires and a very minimal amount of MRI evidence that Although, kind of li lines the brain activity up. It but kind of it, is make sense. it is interesting to think that if you your intended actions are taking place also in a hemisphere or hemispheric area related to mm. a certain emotion that those emotions might also go along with the movements that you're making. I would toss that out altogether. I would say that our, our brains are, the left brain, right brain thing is completely overrated. It's all happening all over the place all the time anyway. It doesn't really matter as much. What I would suggest is it was probably has much more to do with like tr grabbing a pair of scissors and finding them very difficult to use because they're designed for a right-handed person. Probably. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be a, an accum accumulation of those little things that right-handed people are completely unaware is a big frustration in this world. But, you know, the scissors just they don't cut right because I can't get my hand in the thing the right way. And the same thing with the can opener and the same thing with the everything opener. It's just, it's probably more to do with that. Yeah, and I was uh, one of the original studies that took place. I think two thousand eight or so. It was a survey based uh, based study, so it wasn't actually looking at anything to do with the brain. It was just asking people who were left handed versus right handed questions about stuff, and it concluded. One of its conclusions is that uh, 
left-handed people were more prone to these emotions um, but then so were women and I thought that was really interesting and so I started thinking about the survey questions I was like you know the way that we teach people who are left-handed to write we're constantly telling them they should be right-handed we're constantly trying to give them right-handed scissors or a right-handed notebook or whatever it is everything most of the things that they have to use in the world are for right-handers and they grow up going I'm different everything's a little different of course you're gonna have issues I love you left-handers <laughs> <laughs> Blair I'm right handed I know <laughs> I occasionally get a spoon that's convex instead of concave oh yeah it's, Yeah, I just toss it's it out and grab another one mm -hmm. oh my goodness okay Blair's here but it is time for a break so we're going to take a very quick break and we will be back in a few moments thank you everyone for joining us stay tuned for more twists after these messages. Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 100,000 books in their, tie in their library, variety of genres, but we know you want the science, or maybe the science fiction, but the science is always really good. We've always found many science books in their library. Uh, you can start a free trial today. That's right. I said free, and by free, I mean you get a free audiobook download. So you should go do that. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash twist. you got to make sure to put the slash twist at the end. Audiblepodcast.com slash twist to get your free audiobook download and to enjoy Audible and to help twist out all at the same time. Twist also has merchandise that you might enjoy. Head on over to twist.org. That's our website to buy some of our schwag. We now have a link on our website that goes directly to our Zazzle store. So go to twist.org, click on the Zazzle store link. It's in the menu bar. And start buying hats, t-shirts, pins. No, I don't know if we have pins. Mugs, fun things, buy things. Christmas is coming. We, let, we would like our goose to get fat, maybe? Please? <laughs> Twist is also supported by listeners like you. And to uh, maintain our minimal ad presence here on Twist, we really rely on your donations. Your donations pay for hosting, bandwidth, different contractors that we need to hire, fun stuff that we like to do occasionally. And we do appreciate any amount that you're able to give, $2, $2,000, you make this show possible. We accept donations through PayPal and we've made the process really easy by putting a whole bunch of PayPal buttons for donating all over our website twist.org. There I said it again. So go to the website, listen to the most recent episode, comment on the show, kind of scroll down and there's the buttons at the bottom, click make a donation. We really appreciate your support. We could not do this without you. Thank you. And we are back with more This Week in Science. Blair, yes. welcome back. Thanks. How was your climate change conference? Oh, it was so good. It, it was just day one. It's two whole days, and then there's a workshop on Saturday, so I'm pretty excited. Yeah, super fun. Park rangers, teachers, people in advertising, people from awesome. WWF. There's all sorts of cool people around. So. The World Wrestling Foundation? No. No, I know. <laughs> wildlife. Yeah. World Wildlife. Yep. I do know this. <laughs> <laughs> 
Ah, uh, did you bring any uh, animal stories, or are you? Yes. Did you? You had time. I'm so amazed. I have some things. I don't have a whole lot of in-depth analysis, but I have essentially some headlines. All right. Can you unplug? Oh yes. <sighs> Thank Thanks you. Thanks for that. All right. Ran in here. Didn't even think about it. All right. Awesome. So uh, I need to like have a twist checklist. All right. So um, first. Dogs, they know the difference between a left-sided tail wag and a right-sided tail wag. Huh? That yeah. means that there's a difference for them. There's a difference. That they mean something different. Dogs wag to the right when they feel positive emotions, perhaps upon seeing their owners, and to the left when they feel negative emotions, upon seeing an unfriendly dog, for example. Wait, 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 wait. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Because I'm picturing... The dog <laughs> wagging, and is it is it is there like a is because it, it, it's once it's wagging, it's how can you tell which way they're propelling it really? Is there is okay, it slower on. to come I back have, one I way have a than the other? Share. I have a screen share that explains everything. I guess that can kind right. of make sense if it's launching faster to the left and the slowly coming back. Screen share. Versus because it's wagging. Okay, it's, so if you look at the silhouette, subjective without seeing. My, if I, if I don't is what we're looking at right my now. My computer. Mm. <laughs> ah, there we go. So you can see it, right? Right. So watch. See we have the silhouette right of a wag. dog. It's definitely so. This is right it looks wag. like Lassie, silhouette of Lassie, and it's definitely it's wagging. It's not straight up. It's side to side from behind. But, we were but you can definitely to, only see the silhouette you can on only the right see side on one side. Yeah. Actually, it's and a silhouette, so I can't tell if we're looking at the front of the dog or the back of the dog. It's kind of upsetting. In that well, regardless. It doesn't cross the body line. But it's not. Right. You're right. It's staying on one side or the other. So mm -hmm. to the right is happy, to the left is not so happy? Correct. And so the way... Oh, I'm trying wow. to end, There we go. So the, they measured... Uh, they measured um, hormone response in relation to dogs looking at other dogs wagging their tail. A dog looking at a dog wagging with a bias to the right side and thus showing left hemisphere activation in the brain was experiencing positive responses would also produce relaxed responses physically, the dog that was watching this. In contrast, a dog looking at a dog wagging with a bias to the left and thus showing a right hemisphere activation as if it was experiencing some sort of negative withdrawal response, would also produce anxious and targeting responses, so as well as are... increased cardiac frequency. Hmm. So not only are left-handed waggers <laughs> more prone to depression, more prone to more but prone they cause depression. anxiety in other people. So I think this is oh, a really wait, interesting um, hmm. designation to indicate, too, is that they don't think the dogs are communicating with their tail wags. Instead, he thinks that the bias in ta tail wagging is the automatic byproduct of different activation in the left versus right side of the brain. So it's kind of a byproduct. It's accidental. It's not... It's so, not this goes, so this kind of goes along with the story that I was talking about before we went to the break. So the idea that the emotion comes first and then potentially directs the behavior and the movement and that somehow because it's wired on the same side of the brain right. in a similar area that the behavior, the movement gets kind of, uh, it, it emanates that mm -hmm. whatever that feeling is. So if a dog is depressed and wagging a little depressed and it's looking in a mirror, it would cheer itself up. No. <laughs> <laughs> Subliminally. All right, moving on. I have a couple moving other, on to another story. I thought, that, other, made, uh, I thought that made sense. No. Oh. <laughs> so uh, oysters may use sound to select a home. Really? Larval oysters are planktonic. So they camp some against or across currents, but they do have the ability to move up and down within the column of water, and as they mature, they develop their foot and they can kind of pick where they settle. When they find the right spot, they attach themselves and remain. And what they found is that when larvae were exposed to reef sounds, at least in the lab, 
the settlement rate increased. Increased. Mm -hmm. So the ocean has different soundscapes, just like on land, and a reef is kind of a busy urban area, quote unquote. Lots of residents, lots of activity, lots of noise. So As they found to, like an empty beach. It's yeah. quiet and nothing's going on there. Yeah. And so oysters, as filter feeders, want to live close to the action. They want to be live right where, downtown. They want to be where all the poop is. <laughs> That's what they eat. Uh, so, Which is uh, why they're an aphrodisiac. Uh, that's right. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> How fascinating, though, that they would be receptive to that, you know, in their larval stage as they're deciding where to land and okay, this is, you know, that the frequency of sound in the water would affect them to such a great degree that that would affect their choice. My money would have been on chemical receptors, but apparently sound has something to do with it. Hmm. So they're wondering yeah. now if they can um, measure the relative health of the reef based on sound waves. So it's something that they're looking into now. Pretty yeah. interesting. And yeah. then the very last thing, just simple, very simple, um... Headline, and I had to do it because everyone would expect me to, um, <laughs> earliest record of copulating insects discovered. Ooh. Yeah. So they found an, a fossil of copulating insects from about 165 million years ago. And it's essentially the same. It's these... Um, frog hoppers type of things and uh, they look like giant crickets kind of and it's essentially the exact same copulation behavior that we see today so it looks pretty much unchanged so that's 165 million years yeah. of copulating that's right go insects yeah so they figured it out they oh, figured out a good way to do it way back then stuck to it if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Totally. Yeah. It really is. That's because we see so much stuff change. You know, that evolution affects so many things. We have this diversification of species and things that stop mating and this and that happens. And it's really, I think, very impressive when you have something stick around that long. <laughs> uh -huh. So, I mean, they definitely figured it out and... It's it it gives us kind of a whole window into that entire world that if that's unchanged in 165 million years, a lot of things probably haven't changed because yeah. that's one of the first things to change because that's the direct indication of whether you will reproduce and perpetuate your genes or not. So it's yeah. one of the things that change quite frequently. So if that's the same, a lot of things are the same. Yeah, that's cool. Hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's what I got. Hey, Justin, you got any more stories? Absolutely. I got a ton more. Boston Children's Hospital researchers regrow hair, cartilage, bone, and soft tissues. Whoa. This is, uh, the, the article goes like this. Young animals are known to repair their tissues effortless, effortlessly, but can this capacity be recaptured in adults? Can adults also regrow stuff? New study from researchers at the stem cell program at Boston Children's Hospital suggest that it can't. No, they suggest it can. It can. Otherwise, I wouldn't be telling you the story. By reactivating a dormant gene called LIN28A, which is active in embryonic stem cells, researchers were able to regrow hair, repair cartilage, bone, skin, and other soft tissues in an adult model mouse. Mouse model. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, It's a very fashionable mouse. Once again, with the mice. Mice, gotta, yes. I always have to try it in the mice first. You gotta then... try it in the mice first, but you don't always yes. want to apply it to humans because they also use urine as cologne for attracting a mate. So not everything translates, but much of mouse biology does. The study found that Lin 28A promotes tissue repair in, a part, in part by enhancing metabolism in mitochondria, the energy producing engines and cells, uh, suggesting that. A mundane cellular housekeeping function could open new avenues for developing regenerative treatments. Findings were published online in the journal Cell uh, today. Nice. Uh, this is uh, some quotes 
Efforts to improve wound healing and tissue repair have mostly failed, but altering metabolism provides a new strategy which we hope will prove successful, says the study's senior investigator, George Q. Daly, MD, PhD, director of the Boston Children's Stem Cell Transplantation Program, and an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Most people would naturally think that growth factors are the major players in wound healing, but we found that the core metabolism of cells is rate limiting in terms of tissue repair. Hmm. This was uh, added by a PhD candidate, Shai Cheng Nye, uh, co author of the paper. I can never. <laughs> the NG. I never know how to pronounce the NG. 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 Usually an Shai N. Cheng Ng. I'm still pronouncing it wrong. You, we will never get it right. The enhanced <laughs> met metabolic rate we saw when we re reactivated LIN28A is typical of embryos during the rapid growth phase. Hmm. Wild. Wild. So, yeah, as so... A, this, this show came up earlier when we were doing a Science Island chat today. Uh, Ed Dyer brought it up. And I pointed out to Ed that there is a, a, a sort of dark side to this technology, this advancement, uh, which is if if age can be reversed, right? We can regrow hair, we can regrow bone, we can change the metabolism of cells and largely not just heal wounds, but potentially even reverse some effects of aging by doing this regenerative ability. Mm -hmm. That it's going to then make anybody who has retired. Uh, able-bodied enough to rejoin the workplace and they'll get rid of Social Security and we'll have to get, all, all the retired people will have to get right this, back on the treadmill. As long as they, uh, I mean, you might be physically able to rejoin the workplace, but at this point in time, and unless brain cells are, uh, are included in that, you're going to be left with an aging brain that's getting less and less plastic the older you get. Still plastic, so, but not as right. plastic as when you were younger. And 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 this research is you're right isn't directly responding to that. And actually, what's kind of interesting here too, um, there was it didn't universally induce regeneration in all tissues. One uh, area where it was largely ineffective was heart tissue. That's interesting. Very, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Heart tissue I know there's, showed little effects. That's that's really interesting because I know there's a lot of uh, great research going on right now, especially uh, here at uh, Stanford down the peninsula and at the Gladstone Institute, where they are regenerating heart tissue right. using different techniques. So it won't be it won't be a silver bullet, but yeah. it will be a uh, silver bullet silver cocktail. Gatling <laughs> yeah. gun of yeah. cocktail yeah. treatments. Yeah. So there's there's it's getting attacked from from many many angles uh, currently, but might not be too long into the future, you know, when aging isn't a cause of death. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. Not that far off, everyone. And also, people will no longer be bald. <laughs> right? Yeah. It'll be interesting. Re regenerate those hair follicles. Everybody, re yeah, and mm -hmm. cartilage. And cartilage, cartilage regeneration is kind of interesting too because isn't isn't that doesn't that I mean is it cartilage regeneration that causes like ears to continue to grow noses or is that is that uh, an expansion of the cartilage that's already there I, I don't I don't know what you know actually that's a place. really in, I have no idea right so that is so, a great question <laughs> so is regeneration of cartilage would it be repairing cartilage that it expanded will will the uh, elder ear shrink or will it uh, just continue to... Well, I do know that the problem with, uh, with cartilage usually is that when cartilage gets damaged, um, cartilage does not have as much... Uh, doesn't have as much capillary blood flow, so it's not as, not as well fed as other tissues. So that's one reason why it doesn't regrow as well. It doesn't get as much nutrients. I don't know. And then bone and soft tissues. Also, an odd thing uh, that while they could they they could effectively regenerate all, all these different aspects of the the biology of a human being or the mouse. Sorry. Um, one thing that was mouse. Uh, yeah, they were working with 
the um the, for some reason in younger mice they were able to re to enhance regrowth of fingertips in the newborns but they couldn't do that one in the adults so there's That's lots of strength yeah there's a there's yeah. still a huge huge riddle here that uh, that needs to be addressed well at some i mean if there's the possibility of taking that embryonic stage of you lost a finger. Oh, it'll just fix it because it's still in that phase of differentiation and, and growth, right? Um, but if you could take that and uh, regrow somebody's lost limb, I mean, that's the that's what we really want. That's what we want to be able to find. Who knows if we'll ever be able to do it? But yeah, here's it a, here's will always another. be it will always be done in a mouse first. I really want somebody to make a video of like the Bionic Man, you know, the intro to the Bionic, the, the six million dollar. But it would be a mouse, yeah. Bionic mouse, Bionic <laughs> woman, and the six million dollar man. Yeah. In the world? <laughs> and this is a uh, cow is curing cancer. New research from a team of researchers in Taiwan indicates that a peptide fragment derived from cow's milk, known as Lactoferrin B25 exhibited potent anti-cancer capability against human stomach cancer cell cultures. This was uh, published in the No Way Biased Journal of Dairy Science, provided support for future use of lactoferrin B25 as a potential therapeutic agent for gastric cancer. Mm. Hmm. Now, the investigators evaluated the effects of three peptide fragments. Uh, derived from lactoferrin B, uh, something that's uh, peptide in milk has natural antimicrobial properties. This one fragment, B25, reduced the survival of human AGS, uh, which is gastric endocarcinoma cells, in a dose-dependent and time-dependent manner. So it, it wasn't probably just drinking milk levels. Right. But under a microscope, the investigators could see that after an hour of exposure to the gastric cancer cells, the, uh, the, the peptide migrated to the cell membrane of the, of the cancer cells, and within 24 hours, the cancer cells had shrunken in size, lost their ability to adhere to surfaces. In the early stages of the exposure, the lactoferrin B25 reduced cell viability through both aptosis and autophagy. Why are you laughing at my pronunciation again? I am. <laughs> <It's okay. Well. laughs> the autophagy is a degradation in the recycling of obsolete damaged cell parts. At later stages, aptosis appeared to dominate, possibly through capsis dependent mechanisms, and uh, the autophagy waned. This is the first report describing interplay between uh, these two in lactoferrin B25. So we hmm. usually try to avoid uh, cancer cures because there's there's a uh, you know a dozen a day that we oh it's, they did it again they cured it again but this one's actually not this one has no potentially down in the future opens a window to future research of this is saying this peptide is effective. Then the next strategy is then figuring out how to deliver the peptide in a, right. in a useful way. Yeah. But not but this is not just finding a mechanism through which future research might open a portal into. This is it's it works on in the petri dish. Thank you, cows. Moo. Moo. Thank you, cows. Yeah, I can't wait to hear more about this and see if it does actually find application. Um, as we come to the end of the show, I wanted to get some space news out. Kepler, Kepler, Kepler! Kepler, Kepler, Kepler was all over the news this week. Um, so many cool stories going on. Um, let's see. Kepler 78b is the Earth's twin. We have a twin, everybody. Mm. But it's not really our twin because it's kind of like hell. <laughs> There's there's an evil and, Blair on there. Is that what you're exactly. telling me? Exactly. No, no, that's With not. With a goatee. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No, not that kind of. It's not like an anti-Earth. Oh. With an evil, yeah. No, not like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, it's uh, it's a rocky planet like Earth, um, and it was recognized in the the way that Kepler used, looking at the dimming of its host star's light as Kepler 78b passed in front of the star. And of course, this there are very complicated algorithms at work to actually pinpoint some of these very distant and um, differently sized objects and differently uh, formed objects orbiting around these exostars. So uh, they learned about its density using ground-based telescopes to try and find out how much gravitational tugging the little star did on the parent star, according to Discovery News. And they found out that it's um, really, really, really close to its host star. So it goes around its host star in 8.5 hours. Once around the star, 8.5 hours. That means it's really close. And it's probably about uh, 2,000 degrees hotter than Earth. <laughs> so when I mean hot and hellish, it's probably on fire. <laughs> Literally. Inconceivably hot. <laughs> Inconceivably. Inconceivably hot, yeah. Something that you just would not even be able to... There are no words that really can relate how hot it would be. Um, it's definitely not in the habitable zone. We can, we can say that. You don't say. <laughs> yeah, but it is one little rocky body out there circling a foreign star just like us. So it's our twin. <laughs> nice. Um, so we and, have a lot of twins, is what I'm guessing. Yeah, and that's where and that's where we're going to be getting in with this story, with these stories in just a minute. Um, another Kepler uh, research analysis has found a twin for our solar system, but not really our twin. But that um, it has a bunch of small rocky planets very close into the sun and then gas giants further out. So mm -hmm. the model of solar system development mm -hmm. that we have been developing based on our own solar system, it matches this other one. And so now we have something, another solar system to compare against. See, and that makes cool. our solar system less of a coincidence, wouldn't you say? Exactly, mm -hmm. less of a coincidence. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to my next story, um, again based on Kepler and the number of uh, exoplanets that they have found and looked at. So there were 42,557 stars in the Kepler sample that were about the sun's size and temperature. Okay, that's a lot of stars. So, let's try and figure out how many are probably have planets around them. So they found they they have found 603 planets. How many of those are Earth-like? So they looked at planets one to two times the radius of the Earth. They found a bunch. Blah, blah, blah. They found uh, so we have ten planets that are potentially Earth-like out of the sample of 42,000 stars. Okay, so mm -hmm. this is going to be, you think, oh, it's, that's pretty rare, not very much, according to Phil Plate, however. Um, the way that it all calculates out, 22% of sun-like stars have Earth-like planets. Mm -hmm. because of things like uh, the way we are measuring. You have a star, and we measure whether or not there's a planet there by whether or not the light dims when a planet passes in front of it. Mm -hmm. So if the planet is going around the star on a different ecliptic, mm. then we don't even know what's there. So we had to take a bunch of different factors into account, and what they have calculated is that 22% of sun-like stars have Earth-like planets, and Phil Plate says that the nearest Earth-like planet might be only 12 light years away. And there are over 100 sun-like stars within 50 light years. So we probably have Earth-like neighbors in our vicinity that we have which is very exciting. Totally awesome. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, 22%. Sweet. Of all sun-like stars might so be. Let's send out okay. some probes now, right? Yeah. So all I have to say is thank you, Kepler, for this awesome information. It's really, really cool. And if there are that many Earth-like planets in our vicinity, how many of them are within the habitable zone? And then if we think about the way that uh, comets might have um, brought uh, material, the building blocks of life into our solar system, they'll, they're probably doing that in other solar systems, and you can extrapolate away, right? Sweet. Yeah, I'm not going to say we've been visited by aliens. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there at all. But I got I got to shout out a couple of quick ones before the end. I got to I got to shout. Life is got just got sweeter here on Earth. Uh, University of Granada has proven apparently that the more chocolate you eat, the lower your body fat level will be. I love chocolate. Thank you for this story. Study involved 1458 <laughs> uh, individuals between ages tw 12 and 17. And showed that a higher level of chocolate consumption. <laughs> That's not fair. What? Twelve and seventeen. That's Between like when you have a high metabolism and whatever. It showed a high level of chocolate consumption associate was associated with lower levels of total central fat when these were estimated through body mass index, fat percentage measured by both skin folds and by electrical and dependent analysis and waist circumferences. So yeah. then, when you hit seventeen. You just explode, basically. Uh, yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. My metabolism what about, hasn't changed since then. What about people over the age of 17 mm -hmm. by a couple of years? Does metabolism change? Mine didn't. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I want to know exactly how much chocolate I can eat. <laughs> as much as you want, you'll no, never get fat. This is right. the biggest story ever, though, right here, right here. This is the biggest story, and it's too bad it's at the end of the show because okay. it's not going to make it into the, the first hour. We'll have to wait till the after show to talk about it, but there's a device that can convert lost energy and microwave signals into usable power, something that beats out or is equivalent to having a solar panel inside your house. Working day and night. But wow. We'll so that. how if no no tell me about this how efficient? But, but that's is it? if we run out of time. Nope. Okay. Uh, well, they, according to the the research involved, they have been getting energy efficiency around six to ten percent. But with the design, uh, they this new design, they were able to dramatically improve conversion to thirty seven percent, which is comparable to what is achieved by solar cells. This mm -hmm. is grabbing. Uh, the the one model that they made was putting out basically the power of a USB, uh, a little more, 7.3 volts of electrical energy versus the five that a USB uh, power outlet would put out. But they, but this is the early, this is small, this is you know small scale stuff. But basically, what it's doing is it's gr it's able to capture microwave signals and even use Wi-Fi signal that would otherwise be lost bouncing around a room, right, and uh, and t turn it into usable energy. It could also be used to uh, grab energy efficiency from appliances, uh, wirelessly recovering power that is now lost during use. This is, this is, this is one of these, this is, this could be used indoors. I mean, we have naturally microwaves floating around. We have all sorts of Wi-Fi nowadays. Can you imagine if it's grabbing unused cell or even radio signals at some level and getting those leaking into the system? But yeah, yeah current, that's amazing, isn't it? When can I buy it? How how soon can I have it in my home at an well, affordable affordable price? You need to get a hold of researchers <laughs> at Duke University's Pratt School of Engineering and mm -hmm. and ask them how how soon this is coming. Yeah, how is it working in their lab? How have they got how you know how many of these have they got installed? What kind of you know yeah, energy device, load are they getting from it? And it's and it's wireless too, right? It's just yeah. it's just free floating. It wirelessly converts microwave signal into direct current voltage capable of recharging a cell phone battery or other small electronic device at this point. Yeah, so it's basically I mean microwave energy is energy, so it's just mm -hmm. harnessing that energy and then turning it into 
electrical. Mm -hmm. So, um, <sighs> hmm, hmm, and it's at this at a very similar rate to solar panels. Yeah, and it, that's it, the it, awesome part. And it looks like uh, kind of looks like a, a tiny mouse trap, but they're describing it as uh, a an a small antenna array. When, and they, uh, the quote here is, when traditional antennas are close to each other in space, they talk to each other. They interfere with each other's operation. The design that they created here, the, the design process used to create the metamaterial array, takes these effects into account, allowing the cells to work together, and then therefore capture the energy. Cool. So the interesting side of this, you can potentially just gather the, like, in a similar way to how solar panels gather solar solar energy and convert that to electrical. You gather the microwave energy that's in the environment that hits the array, the antennas, and convert that to electrical. And but what about, there are plans, potentially, mm -hmm. I mean, NASA wants to beam microwave energy from space down mm -hmm. to the planet. That mm -hmm. I mean, there are plans to potentially put solar, ener solar collectors in space hmm. and then beam that energy in the form of microwaves down to the surface of the Earth. And here's a here's a. And it, it, <laughs> it might melt this little antenna collector. Well, but, or, but it, what, what it's they, a good start. <laughs> a big part of what they've actually designed here isn't the antenna, but is the the circuits capable of harvesting these microwaves. So, so this technology scaled up would be the collection device then. Yeah, yeah, probably. I think it would be just this this kind of device at a, at a higher scale, a larger. But scale. you could you could just build. This and this uh, antenna array on your ceiling, and all the little bits of energy that are escaping your electronic devices, your Wi-Fi, some free-floating microwaves, even from space or wherever they might be, uh, turn them into a little bit of energy. Cool. Maybe a lot of energy if you have enough of them, because this is the whole thing. Is it's the small little design that they have here uh, that I'm looking at is. It looks like five little antenna array cells. It's pretty small, right? Uh, if you were to upscale this to your ceiling, your roof, or wherever it would be convenient to put something like this, uh, it could, uh, you know, just you're just creating larger and larger blocks of this in the chain that are creating more and more energy, or gathering more and more energy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is... This is interesting. This is really interesting. I like it. I like it. I think. I think this is a good direction. I'm hoping that they uh, they get this into 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 manufacturing soon. Mm -hmm. Agree. Make it so. Yes. Awesome. Sweet. Yeah, that's super sweet. All right. Have we hit 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 the end of the hour? I didn't get to I the pee some... story, but I think I think that's okay. I had a dark matter story. They didn't find any. Ah. <laughs> uh, the large underground xenon experiment, otherwise known as Lux in South Dakota, it's one of these wonderful mines transformed into a science experiment has uh, operated for over 160 days and found no no signal that looks like it would be dark matter. And so uh, because this is the most sensitive at various uh, various frequencies at various um, at various levels, currently physicists are, have concluded that previous dark matter sightings at different dark matter uh, dark matter uh, telescopes or experiments have Probably just been errors or fluctuations in the force. Yes, there is yeah. no such thing as dark matter. It has now been proven. Well, no, that's not <laughs> what has happened. It just means that at this particular, you know, what we've been looking at so far, it's not in this drawer. It's not. You there. can't no. prove a negative. Right. I still believe. I still don't. I mean, I lost on the. I lost on the uh, Higgs, I guess. But I still don't believe in dark matter, and I'm not backing down from that. 
<laughs> you know, that's fine. We don't know. I mean, seriously, it makes it up me. so much of... It, it's something. It is something. No, it's nothing. It's an illusion. Okay, well, it, whatever. It's the dark matter illusion. Yes. I mean, it is It is something it's that we know is missing. Stuff. Or that should stuff. be there. Something should be there or is missing, and there's something happening. There's a hole there's something in our understanding. There's something happening, it doesn't need to be stuff. you got to get off the particle thing. And it's called dark matter at this point in time, and it might yes. always be called dark matter. <laughs> I still don't think it's the stuff, but but if they prove it to me, then I'll have to... I'll have to agree. <laughs> If they prove it to Justin, this is it. This is it. So, so in the skeptical handbook, you know, it's the extraordinary claims require extraordinary results, yes. and in the dark matter handbook, it is prove it to Justin. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Take note, scientists. <laughs> Take yes. note. Dark matter uh, <laughs> researchers looking for dark matter zero. Justin also zero, and I guess it'll always be. Actually, it's just gonna be. It's gonna be binary. It's gonna be me one, them zero, until it's found. And then it would go the other way, because there's yeah. not a whole lot of increments. It's either gonna be there or not. Uh, I guess my my final 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 story is a. Um, it's one out of Texas. Sankar Chatterjee, Horn Professor of Geoscience, Geosciences, and the curator of paleontology at the Museum of Texas. Tech University has taken a whole bunch of studies that we have talked about previously at different levels and put together a comprehensive theory of how life began on our planet. It's actually very interesting and I will put the link on our website and uh, if you want to read the read the, the brief a little bit more deeply and take a look at the images but uh, the idea is that at uh, one point in time, there was the cosmic age where we had the importation of biomolecules, molecules able, able, capable of being able to form into uh, life at some point. Then the geologic period in which he says there's a concentration of biomolecules in greenstone hydrothermal vent environments and homochiral monomer monomers. Um, and it was during this geologic age dur uh, in which we had like the Chicksa Club imp impact and other meteor events that created these big uh, meteor impact meteor craters. And in these craters, we probably had uh, the formation of of uh, the primordial soup. That there were areas within these craters as a result of them that that the soup was able to form. Then came the chemical stage, polymerization, and encapsulation on mineral surface of basin floors. So in the primordial soup along little pockets, there's little bits of mud in which and uh, minerals that allowed polymers to form and basically created protocells uh, without were kind of chemical or mineral membranes. Um, and then additional symbiotic relations of RNA, proteins, and DNA. And he doesn't posit the RNA world, he posits in an RNA protein world in which proteins were very important for allowing to RNA to get its start. And then finally, the biological age in which we have cell replication and ta-da, humans. Right. All right. So anyway, he just basically this. took a whole bunch of stuff that we've talked about before on the show mm -hmm. and he put it all together and made a story out of it. Nice. And it's nice. Yeah. So I'll put the link on the website, and y'all can read through it a little bit if you're interested. Huzzah. Huzzah, yes. And now we have come to the end. It is the end. Sciency friends, the end of another hour of twists, the end. I think we're over an hour I'll again. I'll never <laughs> look into your show notes again. You oh, no, you the show notes. Oh, yeah, I can't <laughs> get in now. <laughs> All right, we will be back next week here on uh, using Google Plus Hangouts on Air. You can find us twist.org slash live 
for our live broadcast on Thursday nights sometime around 8 o'clock p.m. ish. Uh, we're also found on YouTube Live and youtube.com slash This Week in Science. Yes, thank you everybody for listening. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory. Or if you have an Android device, you can Google Twist for Droid in the Android marketplace. Also, the iPhone can be Googled for Twist, T-W-I-S, to find it there. And for more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website, www.twist.org. That's T-W-I-S dot org. We also want to hear from you, so email us at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at thisweekinscience.com, or Blair Baz at twist.org. Be sure to put twist TWS somewhere in your subject line or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also contact us on the Twitter at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Flyer, or at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that came to you in the night, please let us know. And we'll be back here next week. We hope you'll join us again for some more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember... It's all in your head. This Week in Science This Week in Science This Week in Science this week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming, gave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just better understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma, got the eye Ay, 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 ay Cause it's this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. science. Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got But how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science 
This week in science, science, science. This week in science, this week in 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 science. That's the end, yo. Yeah. We did. We did it. That's the end. Don't I look warm? Yeah, I put myself on warm too. I feel less green. I look less green, right? I like smooth though. Smooth. It makes me just feel so young. Smooth. See, okay, so help the color uh, deficient. So this is my original. I feel like I looked okay, I green, can't right? See it. I see a frog here. I need to go to it. You do look, look a little green, yes. Okay. So then original. And white. Smooth is better, right? Smooth is nice. But it's is it still green? Still green. Okay, warm is not green? It's not green. Warm okay, nice. so if I just do warm, that's it's kind of fine. pinky and too that's too bright. Bright is weird. That that's not as good. No. And they warm. enhanced is super dark. Warm. Not green. I don't know. I don't know. Warm, not green. Yeah. Right? Yeah, when I do enhanced, it gets really dark. It's like weird. Mm. Dark. And it gets darker and darker the longer I sit here. Focus is Whoa. just a little scary. Makes you look like you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> brighten. Brighten. Not brighten. It's a little too bright. Wow. Spotlight. I love the that spotlight. That looks weird. I'm falling. Oh, like that weird. effect they do. I know. Warm, I feel like, is a little bit too, too yellow on my end. I do like smooth. Black and white is nice too. But then there's the good old original. Oh yeah. Which I gotta, I gotta say, I do like the good old I just original. Just look green in my original. The other version is I could turn off this really bright light, like so, and then uh -huh. I could go to brighten. Oh, there you go. Is that a... I don't know. I look kind of washed out. You're too dark in the front. The background's too bright. Yeah. <laughs> Looks funny. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> you need more light yeah. on your face. You do. Yeah. But it's a green-colored light, huh? Yeah. It's Well, it's it's a, it's an LCD. LED. L whatever the word is. <laughs> I'm tired. I'm so tired. You've been working hard, yeah. Oh, my God. The climate change conference here. started at 7. It was over what? 12 hours long. That's really long. Yeah. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that... <laughs> Why did you say 7 in the morning? Is it necessary? Scientists. Yeah. Scientists, Scientists are crazy. <laughs> People like to get up too early in the morning. Mm -hmm. Well, about half of the people going to the conference are staying where the conference right is, but yeah. but still, still seven is early. Nobody likes that. Yeah. No, nope, nobody likes that. Yeah, so is it seven be... in the morning for for food at least? It's just like a yeah, there's continental food. breakfast kind of thing. There's food, but they, they start start actually pretty talking soon. to you at seven. They start shortly after yeah. oh, seven, but the food is at seven, yeah. Early in the morning. Did you have a fun Halloween? I did. I went to the um, nightlife at the academy, and there awesome. was a jumbo squid dissection, dissection, excuse so I'm me. I'm sure you were very happy. So that was pretty cool. Um, there was also a drag queen contest, or drag queen costume contest, which is very fun. And I went in the Earthquake Shack, which I hadn't been in there since the new Earthquake Shack went in. It's really cool. Yeah. I keep wanting to do that, but I keep going into the academy with my, with my child, and he's not old enough to go in the Earthquake Shack. Oh, yeah, it'd scare him. Yeah, so I haven't... I, I haven't been able to go in myself. Mm -hmm. Soon <laughs> enough. Refugees, refugee says, in brainwashing, they try to deny you sleep. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they 
deny you any <laughs> He's sleep. He's trying to get my goat again. Uh-huh. With Reputy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. That's funny. As I learned some very interesting things, though. Um, oh, what was the... Ooh. Ooh, ah, ooh, uh, uh. My notepad is far away. Uh, wait one second, because I want to get the number right. It's okay. one really quick thing, and then I, I want to go to sleep. <laughs> okay. I like this story, Strengths. I think I saw something about that. Freakish. It's not really freakish. It's just unusual. Asteroid discovered resembles rotating lawn sprinkler. Yeah, it has like seven tails or something. Oh, Rotating, yeah. What's happening? Nothing. A story that Strengths put in the uh, in the chat. I think that's when I saw early. Really interesting. Uh. 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 uh Justin's still in the fifties or something. I'm using an old computer. Ah, here yeah. we go. Old computer. It, right. It's it's a black and white. In America. Oh dear. Seven in ten people believe climate change is happening. Okay. That's a good number. That's a vast improvement over the uh, last decades. Five in ten Americans believe it is human-caused. Okay, right. half. Which, which really leaves, really just leaves two out of no, ten Americans. No, that's not who, how that works. Right. No. Three out of ten. <laughs> Three out of ten people in America believe people in the U.S. are currently being harmed by climate change. Only three out of ten. Wait, no, no, wait a sec. Wait, wait. I think I'm right. Let me back this up for a second. So seven out of ten believe that it's happening. Correct. Five out of ten believe it's man-made. So that remains there's two out of those ten who believe that it's happening but don't think that it's necessarily man-made. Yes. Then three yes. out of... 10, which is really three out of the seven, eh, so a little less than half of those that believe it's even happening, believe that it's currently causing damage. Right. Whether or not they believe... Right. So that's that's a problem, that, that only three out of ten people believe uh, that people in the U.S. are being harmed. Four out of ten no. people believe people in the world are being harmed. That's pretty okay. low. Okay, well, no, that well, means one more... Oh, that's actually no. That's a bigger number because that means three out of the ten who who don't believe who believe only three out of the ten believe that in America we're being harmed. I would assume we could probably count those three, but though not necessarily. That those maybe those three out of ten, maybe it's some of the others that believe people elsewhere are being harmed. Plus one more, which is significant. Uh, that somewhere in the world the damage is visceral, evident, and impactful, even though they don't see it here. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Six out of ten believe climate change is affecting plants and animals. Mm -hmm. So, not affecting anything here in America, just plants and animals. Uh-huh. But this is the, the word that I think is essential here is harm. Yeah. So, so yeah. who, when I think of harm, I, as a scientist, want to know exactly what kind of harm. So, are we talking about health? It's are however we talking about economic harm, right? So, it could be any. however anybody interprets we'll just, the word, we'll just, right. we which could just use is going to throw a wrench, which is going to totally throw a wrench in that survey. So, I actually will. I'm going to debate that number. Right, but I'm gonna, let's let's. I'm, I'm going to not if, trust that one. If we interpret harm in its smallest caveat of meaning, we we would say it's causing an impact. That is different than how the the plant would normally be. So it's causing an impact in plants. Six out of ten. That's a significant number. That's a majority that believe there is an impact currently affecting. Anywhere plants. on the planet, plants and animals, only six yeah. out of ten people. But that's um, more than think it's it, actually affecting anything. In the, ugh, okay, so, so here, here's the two kickers. This is no the two harm, things. not that's, affecting that's, harm. No, no, the totally plants and different. animals. The plants and animals was an effect. It's just effect, not yeah, necessarily impact. harming. The just harm, affecting. The harm was was directly to people. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I have to look specifically at the study, but I do think they defined harm. 
and I do think okay. they indicated that it could be anything. Um, okay, so three out of a hundred Americans believe humans will successfully reduce climate change. And is that That's us? Not very much. Is that us <laughs> just sitting here? Is which is us? which is the biggest problem is that if they don't feel if they feel defeated already, there's they no point it. to pay any attention. But yeah. this is the really scary thing too. Is so they were saying there's four main things that you want people to understand about climate change. It's real. It's human caused. It's bad. And there's hope. Those are the four things you're supposed to understand. But in order to understand those four things, those all fall in line if you understand just one thing, and that is that um, that most scientists agree mm -hmm. climate change is happening. So if people understand that scientists agree about climate change, everything else falls into place within that parameter. So currently only four in ten Americans believe a majority of scientists think climate change is happening and only 13 percent of Americans believe 80 to 100 percent of scientists think climate change is happening. Wow. That's the real The messaging has been, yeah. That is the number one issue apparently. The lobbyists it's, You know, according to that study. To, yeah. <laughs> the anti-climate change Our lobbyists. number one thing <laughs> is we need people to know that scientists agree about climate change. Right. So of, of the, now what's interesting is the, the, the deeper drill down on this is of those who didn't believe that global warming was happening, that the, 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 that's that number, uh, one out of ten said the reason that they didn't believe global warming was happening, it wasn't that they didn't think it was happening or not happening, it's just that they didn't know. And when they were asked if they if they didn't know because they didn't think there was a consensus within science, or if they didn't hadn't heard about the issue mm -hmm. yet, one out of ten of those said they didn't know. When further drilled down on that that segment, when they were asked why don't you know, half of them said because they hadn't been reading the news. The other half said they they didn't listen. Well purposely avoided getting new information from any source. And yet, one out of ten of them also said they didn't know why they didn't know what global warming was or whether or not it existed. When they drilled down further on these people, they found them to be complete imbeciles. <laughs> but see, even complete imbeciles vote, they make do. decisions every day. Oh yeah, eight out of ten world. of the complete imbeciles voted. It was actually much higher than the national average. That's why you got to talk to everybody. You can't discard any audience. Right. Twist needs to go knock on doors. Oh my god. Or I could just teach America's <laughs> youths, which is what I'm planning on doing. Can, so. can we can we can we steal from uh, Bill Nye and, <laughs> and the uh, and the Jehovah's Witness kids yeah. and do like go door to door wearing bow ties so we could be like instantly identified? Like Hi, so there's a knock on the door, you open it up, there's there's two young people with bow ties. Oh, it's the the twist people. <laughs> They've come to to share a message with me. I know how to tie a bow tie. I do not. I, know I don't even know how on. to tie a regular I'll tie. I'll teach you. I'll I teach you both. Helpful. <laughs> oh, yeah, and everyone says that there will only be jellyfish by then. Oh, moon cat and the jellyfish. Jellyfish, they are taking over the oceans. People have been talking about this for the last several years. This is not new news. They love the acidic ocean. They love it. They love it. We're going to be eating jellyfish sushi. You know you're going to not like it, but you're going to have to eat it because otherwise there's nothing else. And no swimming. No swimming. <laughs> no. Owie, owie, owie. But we probably won't have to worry about being eaten by sharks. It'll just be being, being stung by jellyfish. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> We don't have to worry about getting eaten by sharks now. Yeah. Um, interesting. No, we don't need to worry about that now either. I was just saying that you know their numbers are probably going to go into decline uh, even yes. further as the jellyfish go up. Mm -hmm. Is all I was trying to That's imply. True. But um, 
I was thinking about Russians and I was in Russia several years ago and talking with them about climate change and all of uh, I had a small sample set of Russian university students between the ages of about 18 and 21, 17 and 21. And um, the the majority of them, I, I have to say, I didn't talk to any Russian students who didn't think climate change was happening. So all of my Russian university students were pretty convinced climate change was happening. They had, um, you know, they they were listening to their uh, grandparents and the anecdote anecdotal stories about how the the weather was changing year to year to year, and basically that the stories from the grandparents to them um, were suggesting that climate really had shifted. Uh, to a, gosh, all of them. I don't think I talked with an optimistic Russian while I was there. It's not an, I don't think it's a Russian trait. But none of the, none of the students, I asked them if they thought technology could solve the problem of well, climate yeah, not, change. Not Russian technology, certainly. <laughs> Maybe. And Russians put things together with like duct tape and pencils and go to the moon, you're fine. They get things up, they do things. They're, they're, they're MacGyvers. Yeah, one they of the, one things, of the things happen, but they, none of the students I had were had any optimism about our ability to solve the climate change issue. So one thing interesting is uh, I've noticed that people tend to believe what they want to believe and assume facts, not in evidence. I had this gun That's control, true. this weird gun control issue where somebody was saying there's a lot more uh, gun deaths in California than there are in Texas because Texas has uh, concealed carry. So you never know who's got a gun. Everybody, anybody can have a gun, so it's not worth pulling a gun on somebody because, you know, or, or any. So I'm like, uh, I called uh, BS. I said, well, let's look it up. Let's look it up. The per capita. Where is there more gun deaths, Texas or California? And it wasn't, it, it was uh, seven out of a population of 100,000 in California versus 11 something in Texas. And they, the reaction to it, and there was a couple individuals who were purporting this, uh, their reaction was, well, that's because if you have a concealed carry, there's more justifiable <laughs> what? Gun, gun homicides. You know, people are stopping robberies and stuff using guns. So it was, the, 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 they, it didn't matter what the facts and actual we'll evidence rationalize were. rationalize it. It it's was justifiable for some reason. <clears throat> right. Somehow what I want to believe is going to be sustained by lack of evidence or I could reinterpret the data that's not there. But the fact was it was almost a twofold, uh, getting into the territory of a twofold increase in a place that had uh, the lax regulation. Places with, uh, this is just, a, you know, with the highest regulation, I pointed out, what, New York, Hawaii, California, have the lowest rates of gun uh, deaths in the nation. The places where the gun regulations are the most lax, your Texas, your Alaskas, your Louisianas, uh, the highest. Louisiana was something like 20 out of 100,000. It was hmm. almost threefold California. So, you know, but they, they didn't impact their view on what they had said earlier because they didn't want their viewpoint to be wrong yeah. So facts, and this is this is by the way, when you have um, false beliefs that cannot be refuted by facts, this is called delusion. <laughs> it's an actual thing that sometimes gets treated uh, by psychologists. So how do you treat delusion in society? Is the, the bigger question. The short answer is, you don't. Right. You focus on the people who are going to be swayed. There are certain people who you probably won't sway no matter what. So you focus your energy on the the middle group. And if you can get the majority of people on your side, in a generation or two, those dismissive people will be gone. <laughs> and so, you don't need them to enact change. You yeah, need... I'd uh, you need maybe 80% of people to get the government to turn around what they're doing, 70, maybe even 60. 
you don't need that that fringe group that 100% will never change their mind about anything. Yeah, a very vocal fringe group, though, can change a lot of other people's minds. Definitely. Um, so it's important that... to combat kind of fight fire with fire. That's part of the problem is, like, scientists, we're not as good with the um, propaganda slogans as other groups are. Yeah, and part of, part of it also, um, I've read as well that it ha uh, people take most of their information from people they know, and that... Uh, being a, a friend or an acquaintance, somebody that is trusted, mm -hmm. is um, more likely to give you give an opinion or a fact, quote unquote, weight in somebody's mind and change their mind. So, sure. so, so that, there... that discussion you get into with somebody, you have to really start getting to have you're, you're having a you're creating a friendship, you create a bond mm -hmm. with that you can then take to the level of well, hey, let's look at this another way you know, and see if you can continue the conversation and keep talking about it in a respectful way. So there's that. And then there's also how much of how much of the opinion of the masses actually matters to affecting change. And this is this is I think this is where you get into more where these messages really need to be targeted. And I think I think we can take a good clue from Congress's attempt to cajole science into meeting a couple of needs. Um, anything that has to do with climate science should then get funded because it immediately affects national security uh, as well as the economy in many industries. Right, right? but just like so, I told you, the majority of Americans don't think it affects them. Right, fine. So forget the majority of Americans. Focus in on something like the American farmer. Right, the American farms are going to be massively impacted if climate change uh, dramatically increases. Right, so there's now there's an industry that has a voice in Washington that has a strong lobby that has, is kind of hard to go against the farmer. It, it's just a difficult thing to do politically. So it's something like that is is where I think we need to get the message across. Because individuals, individuals have no perspective of their place in, in society. Industries do. Mm -hmm. If an industry feels threatened, uh, that industry as a whole has a lot of weight to our political system. Uh, good, bad, indifferent, whatever, however you think about that, that's fact. So all these, all they livestock... Money. Yeah, they have money and they have influence because they affect stock markets and commodity trading and every base type of thing we grow, uh, livestock as well as plant that we use for food or fuel, impacts stock market, it has commodity markets and everything else behind it. If that stuff feels threatened uh, by, the, by the future of you know, the climate, then, then that's going to have a, a larger impact. You know, individuals don't have a good sense of their place not just in the world, but in our society. I mean, most if you ask most Americans what they think income disparity looks like in America, no, they're they way will off. be off by mm -hmm. several magnitudes. Mm -hmm. of the richest person in whatever town you live in, the mo the wealthiest person in whatever town you live in, is way wealthier than you think. <laughs> yeah, is probably indistinguishable from your wealth to the you know the the top one or five percent of Americans. It's it's that it's that absolutely diverse, except for where you two are, because actually you probably got some really super wealthy people in San Francisco. But possibly. Possibly. But but possibly. for most of America, for most of America, the wealthiest industrialist tycoon in your town, wealth wise, is probably on a bar graph indistinguishable from your wealth mm -hmm. compared to the wealthiest American. So, so them understanding how much impact something like a global warming will impact them locally, it's just inconceivably hard to, to picture that. I don't think so. I think if you point to things happening right in front of their face and go, did you notice that this is happening? This is why. I think it's very easy if you can pinpoint to things that matter to them that they have seen in real time and indicate what it is, they will have a light bulb moment. I do believe that. You just have to find something that's happening to them personally and explain it. Like maybe, oh, 
Do you have asthma? Mm -hmm. well, warming increases pollen. Pollen increases asthmatic irritation. Yeah. Just make it something very simple that affects them. Do you go take your dog out to the beach? Have you noticed there's less beach? <laughs> you know, Have I don't noticed. There's not quite as much beach as there used to be. Yeah, I mean in some places in America, depending where you go, there is mm -hmm. a huge visible change. Do you like to snowboard? Was there less snow this year? Should there be snow on the ground right now? If you like to snowboard and you want to snowboard when you get older, get on a bus instead of your car. <laughs> I think I think it, you can you can you can turn it into something that is a lot more simple. You don't have to make it as broad. And I think that's where we lose a lot of people is we make it too broad. If you don't want to eat your chicken salad with jellyfish. Mhm. Mm <laughs> yeah. If you Actually, don't want that, do you like if salmon? If you don't want jellyfish eating your chicken salad, <laughs> then you should really consider. Do you like salmon? Salmon eats pteropods, and pteropods are disintegrating. So, so then, so then, it's not even. But I think if given, given media's natural ability to cover an issue. Uh, to follow what scientists are saying and just report the re on the reports, that would be sufficient. But there is a lot of propaganda that is better funded than the message outgoing from scientists saying that it's not happening. The preponderance of money is on one side, and so the fact that 6 out of 10 Americans, 7 out of 10, you think that it exists... Uh, with the, Im the immense weight of money on the other side saying that it doesn't, lobbying against the ideas. It's actually incredible that we've even gotten this much penetration on, on, the, on the science side. But there's going, to be, there's going to be people who have heard over and over and over again that this is some scientific weather channel devious agenda to overthrow the planet and therefore will never believe it. I think that's a minority. Yeah. I don't think that Neil deGrasse Tyson should get to be president. Wait, what? I think we should just have politicians that give a poop about science. That would be great. Yeah. Wait, you don't yeah. think who should be what? Neil deGrasse Tyson. I don't think he should be president. You don't? Th you wouldn't vote for him. For yes, president? You would. Yes. You nope. Would. Versus who? Me. Oh well, if you two are running, you get my vote. <laughs> That goes. <laughs> that goes without saying. Can we just have people on like the environmental panel in Congress that actually know something about science? I know we've no, talked about we this can't before. Because <laughs> we see this is okay, and this is this is a segue. I'm gonna segue back away from it right away. This is also partly why I don't believe we need congressional oversight of the NSA. I also don't think we should have as much congressional oversight of what science does in this country. Because as soon as you have politicians with lobbyists uh, behind them oh, yeah. doing policy and agenda, the actual science can be lost. And in fact, can be completely irrelevant to what's getting funded and what we're concentrating on. Yep. When, when you have a uh, political agenda, especially something as inanely, uh, Congress, you know, when I was a child, I thought was this group of politicians and leaders from around our nation who were working together for a better America. And now I feel like they're, I just, I just feel like it is made up largely of n small, small town nincompoops. <laughs> Who Pretty should much. have no business whatsoever having as large a voice in the future of this great nation as they do? Because yeah. the but everybody—that's the whole thing that like this country is founded on the idea that you know anybody born here could eventually become president. Right, but that's—it's not that. It's 
It's the idea that, that anybody who gets elected as a member of Congress can influence how your surgical procedure is done. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's like when you get life and death, actual, there's an actual night, science night. or education required to understand and enact and utilize and do something that they can, up, they can just be me and be like, I've got an opinion that the human body doesn't actually need a heart. So from now on, we're going to end all heart surgeries. In <laughs> fact, we're starting a heart removal drive. Prove the point. You don't actually need a heart because I think I read something in a science journal once that says you don't need a heart. I mean, that's as inane as it sounds when they are denying climate change or using these bizarre arguments against it. It's as though they were saying something as obvious to anybody on the street as being completely false to anybody who's been paying attention to climate change or global warming. I was trying to. I was trying to remember. Is um. Oh yeah. Uh, something that's very exciting that has happened in our political system. Federal appeals court reinstates most of Texas's abortion restrictions because they were too restrictive to women's rights. Mm, that's so, good. So even though small town, you know, people with different agendas, that there there is a system of checks and balances that does sometimes work. Great. I Sometimes. love to hear it. So, yeah, I mean, well, that doesn't mean that things are not going to continue to go the way that they've been going, but still, this is... Sweet. Yeah. Speaking <laughs> of the federal courts, last thing I want to tell you about that I learned about today that's really cool. We had some teenagers there who had sued the government on behalf of the public trust doctrine which says that it is the government's responsibility to maintain an environment and atmosphere for future generations. Mm. So these teenagers sued the federal government. Good. The, so far, the Supreme Court has ruled that it is actually the state's responsibility to hold the, the, the public trust doctrine. So they knocked it back down to the state level, hmm. but these kids are actually uh, appealing. Brilliant. Huh. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's awesome. And so they, they created yes. all these videos about personal accounts and how you know these kids' lives are already being affected and uh, that, that they think that they believe that their government is capable of doing the right thing to preserve our resources for their future. And that has implications for not just resources for the future and maintaining, say, uh, reducing carbon emissions or increasing carbon capture or whatever the situation is. It has all sorts of applications if it ends up going through to things related to like Superfund sites. Um, you know, what corporate corporations do, dumping their waste in areas where there just are not stringent enough controls and people are getting sick, kids are getting cancer at young ages. There are all mm -hmm. sorts of things happening around our country. Fracking. Fracking. There are things happening all over the place because it's the search for the the dollar now and not the future of the children. Mm -hmm. uh, Tilda yeah. Tilda in the chat room, science should be another arm of government voted on by people with research published in prestigious journals. I don't know about the voted on by people with... Uh, I, I, there's always... This, the academic system itself has a whole cadre of politics involved in it too. However, I do completely agree that we do at this point in our civilization as a country Can I go need a, a scientific branch of government. That would that would be a nice balancing aspect. Yeah. It would be nice if, if they could just at any political discussion on the floor, mm -hmm. someone could just pull out data that's actually real. And this is real data. This is experience Experimentally, empirically shown. Yeah. I like it. 
Uh, it's 10 o'clock. I gotta go. I'm gonna call it. Blair is uh, broken. <laughs> Blair is broken for now. Um, yeah, I gotta. I gotta go. Uh, Blair, I'll be back in. But I agree, data. That's good. Yes, it would be cool. Yeah, if if what you know when they're talking about like abortion, like you were just saying, they could say, well, this research shows that whatever percent of women, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's. I mean, the thing is, they do when they're when when they're going on their long tirades for hours and hours. They do bring up percentages and statistics. The thing but is, they're they, baloney. <laughs> They sometimes are baloney. Very often they're just twisted to uh, achieve the goals that they are after so that they're not, they're just not represented in an accurate fashion. They are accurate statistics, yet not accurately representing the issues. Yeah. I'm going to go so, to bed. So, i got to go. Uh, I have to go what? too. I have to wake up at like 5. Hey, I, and I've got a whole weekend full of debauchery ahead of me, so I should nice. You gotta get, rest to, up get your that. rest in for mm -hmm. some de debauchery. What are you doing? I'm Anything? I'm going up with uh, to Tahoe with 17, 16 other dudes, and oh we're going my. to. We've rented a giant multi-roomed cabin thing with. Big screen TVs in every room, pool tables, and the rest. We're gonna go up and bet on insane amount of football games and <laughs> drinking and eating and farting. Wow, boys' weekend. Well, it's the uh, it's called the Manacy Weekend. We do it once a year. <laughs> I love it's, it. It started it started as mm -hmm. a uh, as a fan a group of people who play fantasy football. Mm-hmm. Going up, which was when it started, I think there was five of us at the first one or two, and it's grown to now seventeen individuals. That's impressive. Oh, um, if anyone's interested, early, early morning, you might be up early enough, Blair. Mm -hmm. If you look into the eastern sky, okay, um, comet Ison should be avail uh, should be visible, and you should be able to pick it up with um, binoculars even. Mm. So it might be with binoculars just a little tiny little not much of anything. Could just be a smudge. It's there. Mm. Early morning. Um, probably until about the at least the 13th of November. So for the next week if you're getting up early and looking at the darkened eastern sky look for a comet. Comet Sweet. Ison. Mm -hmm. Will do. Awesome. It's out there. It is out there. And if you can't get up early and you don't have any way to look for a little tiny blotchy bright little light smudge on the horizon, you can look at pictures on the internet. <laughs> That's what I'm going to be doing. Because there are a lot of people out there who are doing it for you. <laughs> Which is great. Huzzah! I will I think I'll bring my binoculars just in case the, uh, the bear lookout yeah. uh, spot. Binoculars are always good on a weekend. Yeah. Binoculars are always great. Um, Last time we had bear and coyote visits. Nice. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Uh, they were this... attracted by our barbecue. <laughs> the smell of meat. Yes. Science chat, I'm going to try and do tomorrow. I do not have a babysitter on Fridays anymore, so I need to... Um, figure that one out for tomorrow. Um, next Friday, though, I will be on Geek Beat TV with Callie Lewis. I'm looking forward to that. That should be fun. So, um, yeah, if anyone's interested in that, I'll be doing that next week. Uh, I don't think I have a lot more. Do you guys any have anything more? Time to go. Time to go. Time to Good night, everybody. Call. I'm Bye. stopping the broadcast. Thanks for watching, everyone. Thanks for sticking with us for the after show and the in show, right? That's that's the important part. Thank you so much. Hope you have a wonderful night or morning wherever you are in the world. Happy sciencing! <laughs>